<clears throat> We're live on YouTube and get to start. Thanks, Ray. Okay. Good evening. Welcome to the Scotch Plains Fanwood Board of Education regular public meeting, February 25th, 2021. Mrs. Saradaki, will you please call the roll? Mrs. Bauer? Here. Mrs. Boroff? Here. Mrs. Brody? Here. Mrs. Mitchell? Yeah, here. Mrs. Mrs. Suriani? Here. Mrs. Williams? Here. Mrs. Winkler? Here. Mr. Murray? Here. Dr. Kulikowski? Here. Quorum is present. Thank you, Mrs. Saradaki. Please join me in the salute to the flag. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, we just had executive session prior to going into public here. And the items we spoke about were the personnel agenda, the legal status report, and the HIB report. We also discussed a settlement that will be in the agenda on the superintendent's report. We have an addition to the agenda, modified after Wednesday, February 24th, a total of 11 emails were received by the board. At this time, um, Dr. Mast would like to say a few words. Dr. Mast. Thank you, Dr. Kulikowski. Good evening and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, first, I would like to just recap some of the main points from last week's meeting. Elementary students are back to five half days starting March 15th. High school and middle schools are adding alternating Wednesdays in March starting March 3rd. Plans for April through the end of school will be communicated on March 30th for all schools. We will continue to use the rate of transmission, the color coding by region, and our consultation with the Department of Health as our guide. We plan to open for full time in person in September. We will communicate the details written, we will communicate a detailed written plan on April 30th. For the elementary schools, each principal sent out a communication outlining new procedures that support student successful return for five days and some parent meeting sessions have occurred. We will maintain six feet of distance whenever possible. When not possible, students will be separated by a desk shield. These will be in place prior to March 15th. All other safety measures will remain in effect, including mask wearing, daily health screening, frequent hand washing, and careful entrance and exit procedures. We all have that drill now. To the extent possible, short snack breaks will be taken outside. In the event students eat indoors, they will take turns in the classroom. We will continue to inform the school community of any positive cases of COVID-19. Based on feedback, we have also added language to our daily COVID email that clearly states that we have not seen school-based transmissions. This is an important message to balance the transparency and anxiety that comes from seeing the COVID positive information from our school community. We, could, we continue to meet with the Department of Health to discuss our next steps in bringing more students back into our schools. Also, we continue to meet as an administrative team to plan forward and to design plans to bring more students back in grades five through 12. In fact, we will have an announcement next week about our next steps regarding our students in grades five through 12. Our BOE administrators, teachers, and entire staff look forward to welcoming students back to more in-person days in school. We will continue to move forward and apply what we learn works best in our school system that will help inform our plans for the remainder of this school year in September. Thank you, Dr. Mass. Good news. Okay. The New Jersey Open Public Meeting Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interests is discussed or acted upon. 
In accordance with these provisions of this act, the Scotch Plains Fanwood Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof posted at the Board of Education offices located at 512 Cedar Street, Scotch Plains, New Jersey. Such notice was also provided in written notice form and forwarded to the Times, the Star Ledger, the Township Clerk of Scotch Plains, and the Borough Clerk of Fanwood in the annual notice of regularly scheduled meetings as adopted March 26, 2020. At this time, we're going to have our instructional update. It's the Scotch Plains Fanwood Virtual Black History Month Assembly presented by the Black Student Union and Students for Social Justice. And Dr. Mass, will you be doing some introductions? Actually, I'm going to pass that to Dr. McGarry. All right, Dr. McGarry. So good evening, everyone. We are quite privileged to have with us tonight four truly remarkable Scotch Plains Fanwood High School students, um, Chloe, Jaden, Gabby, and uh, where's my other friend? Stella, <laughs> um, who I've had the, the privilege of um, being in, in various meetings of the clubs with them. And I will tell you, there's a, there's a line from a, um, a musical called My Fair Lady, and not My Fair Lady, called um, The King and I, that goes something like this. Um, it says, it's a very ancient saying, but a true and honest thought that if you become a teacher by your pupils, you'll be taught. And this could not be any truer um, for me in every time I've had a chance to, to hear these students speak. But this week in particular, they have taken over Scotch Plains Fanwood High School and taught us all a lot about the importance of Black History Month, both all of our, our students and our teachers. So I'm going to turn it over to them as I share my screen. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, as uh, I've just been introduced, my, my name is Jaden and I'm the president of the Black Student Union. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right into uh, a little bit about the assembly. Um, so the assembly's uh, purpose is to inform and educate uh, students of the significance of Black History Month. Uh, through the assembly, we wish to uh, amplify Black voices, share our perspectives of the Black Lives Matter movement, and set the tone for conversations regarding inclusion and diversity within Scotch Plains Fanwood High School. Um, so the assembly itself is uh, just a bunch of parts edited all into one video, uh, 67 minutes in length. Um, the assembly was sent to uh, all English teachers in the high school uh, to be, and it was shared uh, today and will also be shared uh, tomorrow. So all students can view it in their English classes. And then uh, regarding this, the students will also complete a, and have completed a short assignment for comprehension and feedback. Uh, regarding that assignment, we have uh, also uh, been using the feedback to see uh, what we can do next year because we want this to become uh, an annual thing and uh, we've got a lot of feedback which we're going to uh, show you later. So uh, my name is Chloe Alsey, I'm the Vice President of the Black Student Union and to go in depth about what the assembly um, encompasses, it basically has eight parts, which is the introduction where the narrators are basically giving a synopsis of what the assembly is talking about. Um, the Black National Anthem, which is basically a choir performance with every voice and sing. There's some choir alumni and some current choir members who got involved. Um, there will be some student speakers talking about how to support the Black Lives Matter movement beyond social media. We will also be having some students talking about Black women who are often not talked about within um, our textbooks or in the school curriculum. And we'll also be having students, seniors, actually interviewing um, HBCU alumni from Spelman College, Howard University, and Morehouse College, and asking about their experiences at their respective HBCUs. We'll also be having um, some students sharing poetry, reciting poetry, and sharing their experiences of, of being Black and the Black experience essentially through um, through um, reciting poems. And then we'll have the conclusion and end credits, which sums up the entire assembly. Hi, I'm Gabby Puglisi. I'm a co-founder and co-president of Students for Social Justice along with Stella. 
So who's contributed to this assembly? We had a lot of people working on this assembly. We obviously had the Black Student Union and Students for Social Justice, and we had a lot of student volunteers from both SSJ and BSU. But we had a couple of students uh, who weren't involved in either of the clubs, which is kind of cool to see that it was reaching other parts of the high school. We have SPF HS and HBCU alumni and the alumni videos. Uh, they're, they're a favorite right now based on the feedback we're getting, which is so cool and Mr. Moscow, who's the AV club advisor. We couldn't have done it without him. He taught us how to film in the beginning so that it was all the right way. He put in the music and the slides and he took all our feedback, which was super great. Hello everyone, I'm Stella and I'm a co-founder and co-president of Students for Social Justice along with Gabby. And I'm gonna be going more in depth about the introduction. So we have six narrators, including myself, Jaden Nyamiaka, Chloe Ossi, Gabby Puglisi, Claire Fisher, and Chloe Howell. And we are gonna explain the virtual assembly's purpose on a recorded Zoom call. And then we're also gonna explain that the purpose of the assembly is to pay tribute to black people who have contributed to our society and to pave the way for constructive discussions of diversity and inclusion within our town. In the introduction, we're also gonna mention that our intention is to invoke deep level thinking about race and to gain a different perspective. Also, this is um, the segment called Lift Every Voice and Sing and I am the narrator of this segment, and I speak about the song's significance and its history before the song begins. Then once it begins, it is performed by cur current and former choir members, and it will be recorded on Zoom also. This national anthem will serve as almost like an opening for the assembly. The next segment we have is how to support the Black Lives Matter movement beyond social media. Claire Fisher is going to be providing a recap about the Black Lives Matter movement and the history of it, who created it, and how popular it's been gaining, and the reasons behind that in the recent months. We're going to have students explain social media's role in spreading the message and the pros and cons of it. Uh, after George Floyd's death towards the end of May, there was the outbreak of the protests in June and July, and social media played a giant role in that. And all over social media, you could find messages about the Black Lives Matter movement and tied into that is performative activism, which a lot of people don't know, which is going to be explained in the presentation. We're also going to have students emphasize the importance of community, activist organization, donations, and supporting Black businesses. Hi, so in this scene, um, we'll be basically talking about um, um, historically black colleges and universities. So I'm the narrator in this scene and basically we'll be having, um, I'll be talking about HBCU significance and also why they were established within our country. And um, the HBCU alumni as I mentioned previously were um, Taylor Smith, she graduated from Spelman College lab last year. I also will be having um, Jaheen Grady who is a Morehouse College alumni um, who will be talking about his experience at Morehouse and um, as well as um, Corinne Light, who will be, sorry, not Corinne Light, oh, also we having um, um, Mr. James Baker, will be talking about Howard University. So, and basically in this um, segment, students are learning about the purpose of HBCUs, their experiences and why it has shaped their identity. And it really was a great segment for black students, particularly because not many sometimes do not know much about HBCUs. And it was a great way for them to understand or gauge an idea of if they want to go to HBCU or not. Um, for their undergraduate academic career and also for non-Black students to learn more about the purposes of HBCUs. And many people have this written on the survey that they were very enlightened by the segment and the knowledge expanded on the information we provided them about HBCUs. Moving on, this segment is entitled Commemorating Underknowledged Black Women. And the narrator for this segment is Chloe Howell. She's gonna explain how black women are at the forefront of a lot of social justice movements. And actually a really good example of that is that the creators of the Black Lives Matter movement were women. And students are also gonna explain that because of misogynoir, black women's stories are usually suppressed or not given much recognition. They will then explain that black women have played pivotal roles in history. And as a society, we have to acknowledge their efforts and that we should also uplift fellow black women within our community, specifically the SPF community. We should also uplift them within our country and state and even worldwide. And these four pivotal Black women are Phyllis Wheatley, Andrea Jenkins, Madam C.J. Walker, and Alice Dunnigan. Then on this next slide, we have a video of David Gomez, who is going to be talking about Madam C.J. Walker's story. Last but certainly not least, 
I will be talking about Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker was the first black woman millionaire in America and made her fortune thanks to her homemade line of hair care products for black women. She invented a line of black American hair products after suffering from a scalp ailment that resulted in her own hair loss, which led to the creation of the Walker system of hair care. She promoted her products by traveling around the country, giving lecture demonstrations, and eventually established Madam C.J. Walker Laboratories to manufacture cosmetics and train sales beauticians. Her business acumen led to her to be one of the first American women to become a self-made millionaire. Her parents, Owen and Minerva, were Louisiana sharecroppers who had been born into slavery. Sarah, their fifth child, was the first in her family to be born free after the Emancipation Proclamation. Her early life was marked by hardship. She was orphaned at six, married at 14, and widowed at 20. A talented entrepreneur with a knack for self-promotion, Walker built a business empire, at first selling products directly to Black women, then employing beauty culturalists to hand sell her wares. The self-made millionaire used her fortune to fund scholarships for women at the Tuskegee Institute and donated large parts of her wealth to the NAACP, the Black YMCA, and many other charities. Madam Walker died at her country home in Irvington on Hudson on May 25, 1919, at the age of 51 of hypertension. Her plans for her Indianapolis headquarters, the Walker Building, were carried out after her death and completed in 1927. Today, she is remembered as a pioneering Black female entrepreneur who inspired many with her financial dependence, business acumen, and philanthropy. That was David Gomez. He's a really good public speaker, as you can see, and that's just one of the many clips that introduces underrecognized Black women in history. So the next segment after that is going to be the poetry performances, which I narrate, and they explain the history of Black people in America and a lot of the adversities that they face and the issues and the problems that they went through has been shown through the writing. You're going to see three students reciting their editions of poems written by a Black poet. And as I stated before, you get to see the symbolism of African-American art and the systematic adversities that Black Americans have faced in the past and right now. So conclusion credits. Uh, so for the end, um, we're gonna wrap it up with a closing statement and a, a closing and thank you statement um, from the narrators. Uh, we're gonna reiterate, reiterate key points that uh, uh, you know the audience should have got from the assembly. Um, we're gonna highlight what the audience can do moving forward and explain that although much has been done and this uh, assembly is a demonstration of you know us trying to make a difference, there is uh, a lot that we can do and uh, still much to do moving forward. So we're gonna explain uh, what the audience can do in order to be part of that change if they wish to be and just small things they can do to really get involved and play their part in eliminating racial and cultural discrimination uh, you know, especially from uh, Scotch Plains Fanwood. Uh, we're also going to underline that Black history is not something that should be uh, celebrated only in February, but something that should be celebrated, you know, uh, throughout the year. Because, uh, you know, all uh, Black history is also a part of, you know, the bigger history. So we all just have to, you know, really learn about that too. Um, so finally, we're going to uh, thank the audience for watching. And in the credits, we're going to give a big thank you to everyone involved in order of appearance and magnitude of contribution. So as Jaden said before, today was the first day that the assembly is being shown in the high school to all the English classes. And we sent out a form and we got some feedback. Some of it was negative and a little inappropriate, but the rest of it was pretty positive. And so we kind of thought it'd be a good idea to share some perspective from the students. So first up, we have two quotes from two seniors that Jaden is gonna read to you. Uh, yeah, so I'll just get right into it. Um, the first uh, senior, Ben Friedman, uh, part of my class. Uh, he said, I really enjoyed the presentation. It was entertaining, informative, and really opened my eyes to stories that I really never considered before. Uh, the next senior, Rachel Small, said, I feel like having assemblies like this is really important because it introduces parts of Black history and the Black experience that I, and I'm sure many of my other white classmates, haven't learned much about. Black history in the United States is extremely complicated and rich and important, but we really just learn U.S. history through a white lens, leaving out so many people and their perspectives. 
Um, so being able to see this is, you know, this is really what we were going for. Um, it showed us that, um, you know, people did really appreciate it and that we're making the difference that we're really uh, trying to make. Um, so uh, through uh, things like this, we're able, uh, you know, we're able to have confidence in the uh, fact that we can make this assembly something, uh, an annual thing and really use their uh, feedback and, uh, you know, uh, what they said that we can uh, continue to include uh, in, you know, future assemblies going forward. Uh, so everything just gets better and better every year. Next up, we have two quotes from the people of my class, class of 22. First up, we have Rita Kishin, who said, this assembly was so great. I'm so glad it was organized by all students. It really showed initiative. I love the diversity of all the students involved, which we really appreciate because we tried to make it as diverse as possible. Finally, we have Diana Stankova, and this quote was everything we were hoping would come out of this assembly. This is an incredible learning experience, especially for me as a white immigrant to really acknowledge the efforts put into this country for other minority groups to receive these com the comfort and help they need during these difficult times, especially. The organization was flawless and I believe this assembly should be mandatory across all schools as, a ref as the reference and accurate insights and information should be provided as crucial resources, yet many schools do not. We all kind of thought that this quote was really inspiring because Although Diana has also faced hardship, she really took to this assembly because we shared someone else's story and she felt their sympathy and she heard their stories through different people's perspectives, which is one of the main goals of the assembly. Then Chloe and I had English today, so we thought it would be beneficial to ask our English teachers what their thoughts and perspectives were on the assembly. So I talked to my English teacher, Mr. Ketzner, who presented the assembly today in my 2B class, and he said that he loved the incorporation of music, alumni interviews, and poetry. It showcased multiple perspectives and experiences that were very enlightening, and he also said, well done. And I thought this was very interesting, and I wanted to provide this quote because a lot of people on the Google forum were providing feedback saying that they absolutely loved the alumni interviews and the poetry, and they would also want to see more music in relation to Black artists in maybe a future presentation of ours. And yeah. I also reached out to Dr. Chopra, my former English teacher who I had last year for English. And she stated that students were more receptive to the assembly. Many expressed how it was powerful to see their fellow peers take part in the Lift Every Voice and Sing performance. She also said that when students take initiative like this, it emerges within our student body. This seemed to have a greater impact on everyone. This quote particularly resonated with me because just seeing how teachers are inspired by students leading projects and also talking about how students are expressing interest in are passionate about seeing other people, their peers taking an um, initiative to address social justice is very important. And I'm really glad that we were able to see such positive feedback. And to talk about Ms. Patron's um, quote, a teacher who I currently have, um, she was saying in watching the BSU and SSJ members work tirelessly to create this virtual experience, my joy in seeing the final product could not have been greater. This video is a testament to the lifeblood of our district, the students. May we all be inspired by the ingenuity, activism, and boldness of our young people. They are who will move us forward. Again, my sentiments um, towards uh, this quote are the same as what, doc as what I said about Dr. Chopra, and I appreciate that people are very receptive to this and are proud of students leading this. This is what we want to do. We want students to take initiative. Thank you all. Um, and I do know that, um, you know, beyond sort of the, the, the great work you've done, um, you had a chance to come to the Racial Equity Task Force last week and um, do sort of a, a workshop of, of what you were planning to do and um, the way you responded to the feedback um, that you received there from the, um, the folks gathered was really impressive as well. And we're just so impressed with you. Um, and I know there's one other, there's a, one of your advisors um, of the Students for Social Justice is on the call tonight. I don't, I don't know if she wanted to add anything. Ms. DiBrienza? I mean, I just wanted to commend you guys for your hard work 
um, and for really being willing to tackle these difficult topics. Uh, I think the student body appreciates it. Um, and I also think that um, our district is a place where we can learn together. And I think that's really important. So good job, guys. <laughs> Do the members of the board have any questions or comments? I just want to make a comment. I had the pleasure of um, seeing a snippet of you all last week, being the chair of Wellness and Equity. So I applaud you. I thank you. We hear you, and we're committed to um, listening to you, continuing to listen to you. Um, as you know, you did get some negative feedback, but do not let that deter you or stop you. Um, keep going. We, we really do appreciate this, and we're here for you. Thank you. Stephanie? Um, hi, uh, Gabby, Stella, Chloe, and Jaden. Wow, I just, I, I'm almost speechless. I have to say, when I saw on the agenda that we were gonna have a virtual, a presentation of a virtual assembly, I wondered, um, and what the topic was, how are you really gonna be able to engage the other students in you know these important conversations and um, keep their attention with a virtual assembly? and. Yes, you, you can. I mean, even just the, the 10, 15 minutes that you were presenting that to us, I am so impressed by your content, by how you had so many varied performances, but also factual information. I didn't know that about Ms. Walker being the first um, African-American millionaire. So I, I learned from your presentation. I was riveted by it. So I, I do um, think you deserved all of that positive feedback. And I'm also so impressed by your collaboration. Just the fact that like one of you said that so many um, people at the high school wanted to be involved, um, the Black Student Union and Students for Social Justice and, and other students. Um, what a way to engage your peers. And I'm just so impressed with the process and the content and with all of you. Thank you for sharing. I, I really felt uplifted by that and I learned. Thank you. Ms. Brody. I just wanted to say that what a what a creative collaborative way of educating and enlightening um, everyone. I mean, it, w it was wonderful. Um, and I was wondering if it would be possible if we could get a link to the full uh, assembly so we can watch it. I yes. also, I was gonna ask too, are you gonna show this at the middle school? So two questions, I forgot to ask that question. Um, so we were hoping to share to the middle schools. However, um, Dr. McKenna was mentioning that it may not be enough time to fit as an agenda, but we're going to see if we could do that. And to answer your question about having, you could watch access to the video, I believe I could send that to you. Um, Ms. Patron posted it on our Google Classroom so I can use that to Ms. Dr. McGarry or Dr. Mass and we can forward that to you. That would be wonderful. Thank you very much. I, I, I just can't wait to watch the whole thing. Thank you. Um, yeah, also to build on that, um, we're really trying to, uh, get it out there. Uh, right now, uh, we're trying to um, get it out to the local news network to see if we can uh, post it. There's uh, some uh, legal proceedings we have to do before that in order to make sure everything goes well. Uh, but we're really trying to make that a possibility. And we're also uh, trying to make uh, a smaller version for the elementary schools in order to expand it to them. Um, it's going to be a little later. Uh, however, uh, that just, uh, I feel like that's actually another opportunity to show that Black History Month uh, is not just in February, but it's something that should be celebrated at all times of the year. So even though it's a little bit later, I think it's still a great opportunity for us to, uh, you know, show everything we've presented and especially the things that uh, the elementary schoolers uh, can take from it uh, at like, every level of education. So we're really uh, going to try to do our best in uh, that regards. That's a wonderful idea. Thank you, Ms. Brody. Ms. Winkler? I, I, I also had the pleasure of being at the Racial Equity Task Force meeting last week. So I'm hearing about this again. Um, it's exciting and um, you guys should be really proud. I, I know that we're, we're really proud of you uh, putting it together. And it's, it's a wonderful presentation for the, for the, the students throughout the district. Um, I know my son came home from school today, very excitedly telling me that he saw this really awesome assembly today and um, telling me that he learned things. He mentioned, um, he mentioned Phyllis Wheatley and Madam CJ Walker, and he was really excited about it. So thank you. Karen Mitchell. Thank you. 
I have a question for the group um, of students. Peer mentorship is so powerful. So not only are you inspiring and educating, but you're also setting a leadership example of how when great minds get together, the power and the influence. So could one of you or somebody that's interested tell us and tell the listeners what you've learned through your own collaboration, collaboration and putting this together, what you thought it was gonna be and what it was, because you're also inspiring other people who said, I kind of have an idea too, maybe I'll do it, it's possible. So if you could share quick, you know, summarize what you feel you've learned in the process, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Start us off really quick. Um, when Chloe first introduced this idea, I was like, this is going to be awesome. But in my, in the back of my head, I was a little confused how we were going to do it virtually because we started working on this like in November. So we weren't even back in school yet. So it was like this whole new phenomenon of how are we going to share this? And I thought that it was going, it was hard, but I thought that it was going to come out a little bit worse than it did. So I'm really proud of us for pulling it together. And I think that it just kind of shows that anything is possible. We did this all virtually. I think we met up in person one time to kind of like set up a scene that we ended up scrapping, but we went, we met up once, we did this all online. So I, I think that really kind of shows that you really can do anything if you put your mind to it. That's the car magnet. Thanks, Gabby. <laughs> I definitely think one major thing I learned from this presentation is being flexible and understanding that Sometimes in life, things don't work out as you anticipate. And it's important that you do that because, of course, being in a pandemic, we're facing trials and tribulations. So we at times had some plans that we that have to be scrapped, but we were mature about it and we made sure we improvised. And that's important, remaining flexible. So that's one major thing I learned. Um, if I'm going to add on to that, um, similar to what Gabby was saying, uh, it just uh, this you know, working together in this cooperation really showed me like how far just sheer ambition can really take you. Cause like, I remember when Chloe came to me and uh, she had all these great ideas and she was like, oh, we can do all this. And then we're, we're going to put this into one video. And I was like, wow, Chloe, like, I don't, I don't know if we're going to be able to do that. Like, that's a lot. And then, um, you know, we just uh, kept taking it step by step. You know, we broke it into smaller groups and, you know, the farther we went, it just seemed more and more possible until, you know, the final product came out. And, you know, I still can't really believe that we were able to pull this off. Um, I'm still a little phased that, you know, wow, it actually came out. And, um, you know, I'm just so uh, hyped and I'm just uh, so proud of, uh, you know, how we're able to, uh, work together and that's uh, the reason I'm really trying to get it out there and you know share what we've been uh, what we've been able to create with uh, you know everybody. Yeah and to build on to that I noticed throughout this entire presentation that strength in numbers is very important. I think that without our collaboration and ability to really like bounce off one another and provide ideas and all this I don't think we would have been able to do it and I also noticed that big events take a while, which I, I never really pictured that in my head that this would take months because Chloe introduced this back to us back in November. And I was like, oh, I was thinking we only really needed a month to do this. But no, we had a very elaborate plan. Chloe and all the others, we made a bunch of different outlines that were very in-depth and eloquently written. And we needed those. We, we found that those were like our backbone throughout this entire process because people could refer back to them and things like that. So one thing that I'm definitely going to take away from this entire presentation is that if we are to do it next year, we definitely want to start early and plan as, um, as best as possible in order to produce an amazing product, which it did turn out to be. Planning and execution. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Ms. Bauer. Um, I just wanted to add my kudos uh, to what my fellow board members have said. Um, some of the questions I had written down, um, like when you started and so forth, other people have, have asked. And I was really curious about who the three poets were, but now we're going to get the link. So that will be wonderful. We can, we can uh, find out ourselves. I'm, I'm hoping, I was hoping that it would be posted, but maybe that's part of the copyright or issues you were talking about in terms of, of sharing it to a broader audience. Um, one of the things that, um, I don't know if you've been to board meetings before, but having students attend is one of the things that we really look forward to. And 
student voice has just been so important to me in the time I've been on the board. So you all are so eloquent and um, talented. You have a lot of leadership skills. I wanted to mention to you that we have strategic planning coming up in April and we really like to have student voice uh, participating and giving us input into the future direction. Uh, for the school district. So uh, I want, want to make sure that's on your radar and, and that you can participate if you can fit it into your schedules. And for those of you, I, I think a couple of you are seniors, you're graduating, others are moving up and we'll be able to hopefully carry on this project. But the skills you were talking about uh, when you were answering Mrs. Mitchell's question are really lifelong skills. They're gonna serve you so well. And thank you for, for sharing them with us and with all the students in the district uh, at the high school and hopefully at the middle school and elementary. Thank you very much. Mr. Murray. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pilkowski. I'll try to be brief. So uh, I just wanna, um, I, I just wanna, you know, say thank you to all of you as well. I, I don't wanna, you know, uh, re-emphasize everything everyone said. I had a couple of points uh, based on the question that uh, Ms. Mitchell asked and Gabby and Chloe and, and, and all of you kind of responded. And I think some of the things I picked up on that are, 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 are very, very key to, you know, what we've been hoping for and that, you know, your, your comments around being flexible, being mature, you know, the fact that you're using technology in a different way than you initially thought you were able to. And I think, you know, those lessons in themselves are, are very important, right? They're, de they're definitely different than, you know, you've proven that during this pandemic and through its entire disruption, you found a way to make this work and get the message out and educate um, in a way that you initially didn't think you would be able to or potentially thought you weren't sure how you were going to do it. And I think that's a tremendous skill and trait that you have, you know, really uncovered. You know, I, I, I continue to be proud of all of all of all of the students in our district and, and what, you know, this is another one of those great moments for, for, for all of you, um, you know, from a communication perspective, you were clear, you were concise, um, you were knowledgeable, you know, and, you know, we've seen a lot from the students in this district and, and this just, you know, continues to be another one of those um, things that, that I continue to be impressed with, with what our students are able to do. So thank you for that. You know, my, my closing will be, you know, keep doing everything you believe in and keep educating others because you're doing an amazing job. And, you know, there is nothing, you know, that we've seen that you students cannot do, um, you know, and this is just another one of those things that's is extremely impressive um, and you've been able to do it in, 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 in a pandemic environment. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murray. And might I add, it just proves you don't have to be in the classroom to continue learning. And you improvised, you used a multimedia presentation. Um, it was a very, uh, you know, the small part that we got to see at this time, uh, how interesting it was. You got different people to do different parts. It was not just someone standing there, blah, 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 blah. You, you know, you, you, it's so unique. I can't wait to, to watch the link later to see what, you know, the whole presentation and just your enthusiasm. And you're taking the time tonight to come and share this with us and those who are gonna watch the broadcast. Um, I'm just so uh, impressed and amazed with all of you. And I appreciate all the time and effort that you have taken just to do this. And then not only just to bring it to us, but to, just to do the presentation at all. It's just overwhelming. It's so wonderful. And, and just thank you so much for all you've done. Dr. Mast. So, so you know, certainly I, I echo all of the wonderful things that have been said. And I would just like to highlight one of the comments where uh, you mentioned that through sharing and learning about each other's story, we, we gain empathy and understanding. And the fact that you have made that a, an outcome of this project is in itself inspiring. Um, your, your presentation skills and the, the way that you put together the presentation raises the bar for all of us. Yeah. So, so thank you for um, you know, giving us such a vivid example of excellent work. Are there any other comments? If none, then yes, a round of applause, definitely. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Dr. McGarry, for introductions and bringing this to us. All right. And Dr. Kulikowski, they don't have to stay, do they? Oh, of course not. Everybody's welcome to, but I know, you know, they've already done so much, but they are more than welcome to stay, of course. All right, so this will conclude the instructional update. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And we will move on to our public comment. So at this time, if you'd like to make a public comment, please go to spfk12.org for Zoom login information. And in accordance with the Scotch Plains Fanwood Public School Bylaw 01640165, the meeting will be open for 15 minutes for public comments with a maximum of three minutes per speaker. Speakers addressing the superintendent items, business functions and other board business will be heard first. And if time remains, speakers may address other matters. So if you would like to make a public comment, please go to spfk12.org for Zoom login information. When, you, when it's your turn, please state your full name and the town in which you reside. And please note that board members cannot respond concerning individual students or staff members. Such matters should be addressed by the superintendent's office. So Ms. Broadbent, I ask you if we have someone ready for public comment. Hi, Dr. Kulikowski. Uh, our first caller is Kristen Westover. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Westover, please unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Kristen Westover and I live in Fanwood, New Jersey. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'd first like to say that I'm really happy about the district's decision to return to five half days. Um, I have a kindergartner in the district and it's been a really big challenge to adapt him socially within the district, especially starting all virtually. Um, not knowing any other parents in town and him not having friends in his class. Um, my question is, well, I have a few questions. Um, the first one is, um, why is it taking a month from the date of the announcement to return to five half days to implementing it? Um, I understand that some of the classrooms need to be prepared to accept more students into it at the same time, but Besides moving desks, just logistically, I'd like to understand um, what needs to happen and why it's gonna take a month to prepare that. Um, it looks like some of the classrooms have begun um, installing plexiglass onto the desk. And I'm wondering if maybe we're just waiting on that for more for all of the classrooms and why we don't have that already. Um, we're going almost a year into being shut down from um, full instruction. So um, I'm wondering if it's just like a, if are, are we behind on the planning or like why it's taking so long? Um, I also understand that um, having lunch in the school is a big barrier to getting the kids back in full time. And if someone could just help us to understand logistically why it's an issue. Um, like I said earlier, I have a kindergartner in school. Um, he gets a lunch break, or I'm sorry, a snack break while he's at school. Um, the kids would go outside on a nice day. And I'm wondering why the students can't do that for lunch as well. Um, I think obviously going into a cafeteria is not really reasonable or safe for the students, but I'm thinking we could be creative and having the students eat lunch in classrooms or even cohort and groups in the classrooms. And I'm not really understanding why that that's a barrier. Um, is it a staffing issue? And if it is like so many parents want to help. And if you could let us know how we could help with that to get the students in, we would love to do that. Um, I work in healthcare and I have a job that I have to report to work in person. Um, my employer supplies PPE or personal protective equipment for all the staff to make us feel safe while we're at work. And I'm wondering if the district is doing the same for the teachers, because I think obviously, you know, it's a concern going into a building with a lot of people and it looks like all the teachers are wearing their own masks. So I'm wondering if there's a plan to supply them with some um, either face shields or masks or whatever it is that they need to feel comfortable. Um, the last thing that I just wanted to mention is in the last board meeting, um, a comment was made about um, respectful and collaborative communication with the, between the board and the parents. And I just have to say, it's, it's really frustrating to hear that as a parent, because 
it seems like a lot of our comments in these meetings are met with like condescending tone or not even reply to at all. And it just, it doesn't really feel collaborative. We wanna help, um, you know, we've asked for town hall meetings so that there could be some open discussion between the board and the superintendent and the community. And I'm wondering if um, that's something that couldn't be on the table um, for us as a district. Um, I look forward to answers and how we can all work together to get our children back in the schools full time because they deserve nothing less. So thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Westover. So Dr. Kulikowski, I, I'll pick up on just a couple of those points. Uh, I'll have to go back and, and watch the video to catch all of those questions and I'll, I'll certainly get, get back to you. Um, but the, the last comment that you made, I, I agree with. Our, our students deserve nothing less than the best that we could give them. Um, everyone on the screen, everyone in the district values face-to-face um, -face instruction and we are, we are moving towards that. Um, you know, re regarding the, the comments, of, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want any parent to think that any of us on this screen have any disrespect. One of the comments that I made in the opening is this is, this is an emotional time and we don't want it to be polarizing. It, it has happened and we wanna move away from that. I, I think that it, it's, it's, we understand and, and many of the board members have children too, that it's really hard to, to lose the control or have diminished choices for your kids. And the pandemic has done that. So for that, I'm very sorry. We are, we are working our best towards moving towards normal and we're doing it in the way that, you know, has been consistent in, in following, you know, the guidelines that, that we've been given. But, in, in no way has anyone on this screen meant any disrespect. And just the, the pitch of emotion, if it, if it felt that way, um, that was not the intention. Uh, regarding our timeline, so the announcement that I made is that we were going to an incremental return of our students to the schools, and we were looking for ways that we could, we could open up greater opportunities. So one of the first ways was at the high school and middle school to collapse that Wednesday so students could utilize that alternating Wednesday. And at the elementary, it was to move towards the five days a week. And in working with the administrative team, we felt like we would be able to do it best by starting on March 15th. We, we did consider bringing in different grade levels, but then we also felt that that, that could be more disruptive and it was just better for, for us to be successful, to welcome everyone back at the same time. So um, we, do, we do have quite a bit of those um, desk shields. We, we had enough in the district, so it wasn't that, that delayed. We have ordered more, so we'll have desk shields for the, the K to 12 situation. We recognize as we look towards next year that those face shields or those desk shields would be an imperative tool for, for eating lunch in, in different locations, such as the classroom. Um, as we look towards going towards a full day, you know, as, as our numbers continue to trend to green, we are going to um, need lunch aids. So that's something that we, we have some on staff now. We need more because we're going to have to, um, you know, group the kids in such a way that eating, eating lunch will, will be, be doable. So that's something that we're working on and, and planning towards. Um, and the, the teachers, um, many of them have, have uh, their own face shields. Um, the district does have supplies should they need them. We are, we are masks, but we're also, um, we have face shields available for, for the staff as well. And we, we want to also have those available for our middle school and high school students. Thank you, Dr. Mast. Dr. Kolakowski, if I may, real quick. Yes, go right ahead to Mrs. Silvestro. Thank you. I just want to just one, one part of the, the last member of the public's comment about um, some frustration in terms of the comment process at these meetings. Um, I haven't given kind of this disclaimer the past few because I know that we've had a lot of uh, um, repeat customers in terms of uh, the public, uh, the attendees in, in the meetings, but um, just want to reiterate for the public that, you know, these meetings are really uh, 
serve two purposes. One, so that the public can see the business that is being done by the board, you know, all the resolutions, the presentations. Uh, the public comment period is set so that the board can listen to what the public has to say. It's really, these meetings really aren't set up for a kind of, um, to, to, to borrow the phrase from the member of the public just spoke, a, you know, a collaborative process between the public and the board. You know, this is really an opportunity for the public to express their concerns. Um, if they do have questions, they're more than welcome to, to ask them. Um, but there's generally not going to be a lot of in-depth back and forth at these meetings with the public. Um, on an individual basis, if people have concerns about their specific children or, or specific staff and things affecting their, uh, their individual families, really the best people to reach out to are the, the people that you know, are closest to those things. Your teachers, the principals, Dr. Mast's office. Um, you know, if the, the concerns are more of a general district wide, they can certainly share those concerns with the board at the meetings. Um, but you know, there's not gonna be that collaborative in-depth discussion of detailed plans beyond the kind of updates that Dr. Mass provides at the top of the meeting. So, you know, I certainly understand the frustration uh, when someone comes and they, they expect, I have a question and they speak at the mic and, and they kind of just want the response in the way that they want it, but it's really not, these types of meetings are not how those questions get answered, um, but we are willing to answer those questions. I know the Dr. Mass office in particular frequently, you know, speaks by mem to members of the public by phone, responds by email. So. Those are really the more effective ways of, of having those uh, questions to be answered. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Okay, uh, Ms. Broadbent, the next uh, participant, please. Sure, our next caller is Cami Trepka. Hi, Ms. Trepka, please unmute yourself. When you're ready, please state your name and the town in which you reside. Hi, um, this is Kenny Trapka. I'm from Fenwood. Thank you. Um, sorry, I am uh, about to put the baby, a, a baby to sleep, but um, I have just a few things to say. I don't need answers. It's, uh, it's just a comment just to, uh, and I'll be pretty quick because I have to put him to sleep anyway. Um, so I have three kids in the elementary school and I attended all boy meetings except the last week's one, which I watched online. And since Mrs. Suriani felt the need to express her feelings, here I am doing the same. I don't want you to answer a comment, as I said before. I just think you should slip on it and think about it. Let's, let's talk about disrespect. A while back, I have begged you for collaboration and working together for our kids' mental health and help them not feel so stressed during these difficult times. I haven't seen this on your behalf. Disrespectful means being late, sometimes even 30 minutes to start the call and keep all parents waiting when they have kids to put to sleep, like I am now. This disrespectful is when you are showing up with an attorney to all meetings, even before the lawsuit and having the attorney answer the, to questions you should have instead. When you don't respond to a straight, with a straight answer to questions and parents ask the same ones over and over again. When you have no empathy and your body language show that whenever a parent is speaking, when you take a picture without a mask, hugging each other in a sports field, but you keep schools closed. When you don't have a town hall, parents ha have been asking for so long to have a proper conversation like the attorney just stated. When parents need a lawsuit to make you open school. Mommy. When you pat each other's back and clap when parents are not happy with your decisions and lack of that leadership or planning. When you volunteer in a position you can handle and it's okay not to be able to handle with a crisis like this. Not everyone can do it, but let others handle it and instead. When you take the easy way out regardless of the damage caused to most of the kids, when all sources say it is safer for kids to be in school. If you feel you are not appreciated or disrespected just because parents are worried for their kids' mental health and they don't agree to your decisions, please don't, please don't volunteer anymore. There are kids who do better virtually, but others, significantly others, who struggle and us parents of the latest kid category are watching our kids suffer and it hurts like hell. This is nothing personal, but you all need to realize that your position, paid or not, is one of servitude, of customer service, and you are, and we are your customers, representing our kids, and our children's stake is in your hands. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a huge responsibility. I really hope you realize that. 
in the end, I want to thank with all my heart the school's principal, teachers, and personnel who are doing an amazing job and make us feel safe to send our kids in school. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to make some comments this evening, Ms. Trepka. Dr. Kulikowski, our next caller is Brad Herman. Thank you. My pleasure. Hi, Mr. Herman, please unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Brad Herman. I am from uh, Scotch Plains. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple of comments. Um, one, I, I have a different viewpoint than probably some of the vocal members of this town. I commend the conservatism uh, and the um, caring about students and teachers and staff safety and well-being. And I think, uh, you know, while it was a shaky start, I think uh, the virtual uh, teaching has been very good. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually happy with uh, the virtual option. So what I wanted to ask you, um, I know there's a push towards full-time, everybody in, in school by um, the fall in 2021, which is not so far away anymore, but we also have uh, very rapidly spreading variants uh, especially ones that are known, at least based on UK data, to um, infect younger individuals more. This includes teenagers and older children. And we also have the case where kids are not likely going to be vaccinated by the fall. So my first question is, is there going to be a virtual option in the fall? Um, you know, in addition, I know you're making the effort for the full time, but I'm hoping that the parents still have a choice to keep their kids virtual uh, starting this fall. The second point I wanted to ask is, I mean, I don't know, I know the logistics are a little bit complicated, but um, some of the colleges that I know of are doing this with weekly testing. Has that been thought about and proposed to test the students regularly? And, um, <clears throat> Third, uh, third comment I have is about, um, you know, another thing, my children particularly are very well trained if somebody is unmasked around them to get away. Um, and <clears throat> I, I, I don't know about other parents, but I'd be very uncomfortable with kids snacking in the classroom in the same spot as my children without masks. Um, and therefore, I'd be wondering if uh, kids have a right to leave the room if somebody is unmasked um, as a logistical. I know there's some logistical complications in that, but uh, that was another one of my questions. Uh, but again, I thank all the effort all of you are making uh, in this uh, difficult time. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Herman. So Dr. Kulikowski, if, if I may. Sure. You know, the, the three points that I, I, I grabbed from Mr. Herman was the, the virtual option. So a, as we have our plans being built for the, the full opening in September, we, we recognize um, for, for reasons that he highlighted that it, it's highly likely that we will still need that virtual option. It does um, connect to the governor's orders. We haven't received those yet. Um, I would anticipate that that would still be in place next year and how we can figure that is something that's part of our planning. Uh, the weekly testing is something we have explored. We have brought um, the Union County um, resources to Scotch Plains once. We're looking to do that more. Um, there are also private companies who have approached us. Mrs. Saradaki and I have, have met with one company to, to see how we could have weekly testing uh, available um, for our district and community. So it is something that we're looking as to do as a, a mitigation strategy. And, um, you know, in, in the snacking, uh, you know, I know that the, the principals and the teachers approach it very carefully, where often the kids go outside and they're, they're separated. Um, if they're staying inside, um, they, they alternate rows, the, they're not able to talk. They, they just have to eat their snack, like, 
in, in, in their in their little cubby, and um, it, it's rather quick. And it, it's it is a step towards lunch, but snacks are 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 much much quicker and much easier to control. Um, it, it is all about. It, it's all about the timing that the mask is off. We know in, in, in talking to uh, you know, doctors in town, the Department of Health, our, our best strategy of not spreading COVID is the masking. Other things are important too, that you know the ventilation and the hand washing um, and the distancing, but the mask is really something that lowers the risk of spread. So removing the, the mask is something that, you know, can be done to eat, but it needs to be done thoughtfully. We know that, um, you know, the restaurants are open, they're not open 100%. So when we're snacking, we're not snacking 100% of the kids at, at a time. And Thanks, Dr. Dr. Kulikowski, if I may, sure. just, to, just to piggyback off of the first two points that Dr. Mass just made, um, the virtual option. Right now, districts uh, are required to give the virtual option by executive order of the governor. Um, there's also a, a statute that was enacted back in, um, I want to say it was uh, April or May, where the legislature allowed virtual schooling as an option uh, during a declared health emergency and pandemic like the one we're facing now. Um, to Dr. Mass's point about, you know, awaiting kind of the directions from the governor, uh, if for whatever reason the, the health emergency li order is lifted or Governor Murphy changes his executive order, um, that vir virtual option may not be available, not because the district might not want to provide it, but because we legally would not be. Um, you know, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, virtual schooling was floated as an idea, um, particularly during Superstorm Stan Sandy, a number of towns were, were devastated, their school systems didn't have power for weeks. Uh, and at that time, the Department of Education actually declined the district's request to provide education virtually. So um, I don't anticipate that you know, we're, we're kind of going towards a, a, a pre-pandemic mode of thought. I think that virtual schooling is probably gonna be uh, in, in the conversation moving forward. It's my anticipation, I, I think as it is Dr. Mass and, and the rest of the districts that virtual schooling is likely to be an option for September. I just wanted to make it clear to the public that you know, if the, that option goes away, it might be because the, the, the state has taken that option away from us, not because we've made that determination. Uh, on the second point about um, uh, regular testing, uh, particularly of the students, um, you know, uh, there are districts that are there that have explored and some that have implemented, and I understand that Scotch Plains is looking into offering that as an option, but I do want to make clear to the public that the district does not have the legal authority to mandate that children be tested regularly as a condition of attending school. So just to be clear that while you know, we, we might be able to work with some different groups in, in offering testing and, and, and increasing the availability of testing for kids and families who want it. Uh, we cannot institute a, a testing mandate that in order to attend school in person, you have to be regularly tested. We don't have that authority to do that. So I just want to make that clear to everyone as well. So thank you. Thanks, Doug. Um, Robin, next call, please. Um, Dr. Kulikowski, our next caller is Melissa Janowitz. Hi, Ms. Janowitz, please unmute yourself. Good evening. Um, I'm Melissa Janowitz and I reside in Scotch Plains. Mm -hmm. um, and following Mr. Herman, um, some of the points actually have been just within the past minute or two addressed by Dr. Mast and by Mr. Silvestro. Um, but I just would like to say a couple of things. Um, in response to the recent push and subsequent plans to reopen schools to the fullest extent possible, um, I'm wondering if we can get more information on plans for the virtual students. Um, there have been monumental efforts involved in getting to the point where schools will welcome um, children back five days a week. Um, ventilation, filtration, mechanical upgrades, countless hours of consulting and planning, um, collecting surveys, conducting visits to other districts, uh, increased investments in cleaning equipment, supplies, purchase and installation of the plexiglass shields, um, truly just a Herculean effort to get students back into schools. Um, it was asked at a PTA meeting just last evening what the plan is going forward for virtual students, um, and there just really didn't seem to be a concrete 
plan, the focus really seems to be on getting children back in schools, um, which I don't think anyone um, doesn't want that. Everyone does want that, but in some instances, it may not be in children's best interest based on their specific circumstances. Um, but concern was voiced from multiple parents at two different meetings that I have attended within the district this week about the inclusion of virtual students. Um, and there's, there was a feeling that that has waned um, since the hybrid model was reenacted in January. Um, and we were just concerned about how they would be impacted by having even more children physically in the classrooms. Um, it was also asked whether or not there would be additional opt-in dates in the spring beyond what has been published or if it would be phased out. Um, and again, at what point the phase out may be considered and based on what criteria. Um, I implore you to remember that with this massive focus currently being on returning children to schools, to remember that there is still a population of the school community on the other side of the screen. Um, students and families alike may have extenuating circumstances that are preventing them from returning to schools. Additionally, I would like to know if there's plans for a virtual option beyond the spring, which again, um, I think we had kind of touched on a bit. Um, I'm aware that Dr. Mast has committed to reopening five full days and have pla has plans to release additional details regarding the 2021-2022 school year in May. Um, we're still in the midst of a pandemic. There's still so many unknowns. But one thing that is certain is that we have had to pivot multiple times throughout the course of the past year. Um, and I would hate for the district to leave us unprepared for these circumstances should they need to be considered in the fall. Um, at this time when the focus is just so heavily on returning to school, I appreciate your time and your consideration for the vulnerable, vulnerable minority, minority population of virtual students that have not seen the inside of a school building for whatever circumstance, nor have they had the experiences that go along with being in school for nearly a year. Um, I just urge you to consider how they will be included, how they will be engaged, how they will be supported educationally, socially, and emotionally throughout the spring and beyond um, as we continue to have this focus on getting kids back in school and, you know, that being really what the goal is here. Um, there's just been little to no attention given to the um, issue of the um, plans for virtual students going forward. Thank you. I hold on. My question is, you want us to, to pay more attention to the possibility of keeping virtual as an option in the spring and possibly going forward in the fall. Is that what you're asking us to con consider? Um, basically what my question is are, what are the criteria under which a virtual option will still be considered? Um, and again, I'm still in support of it because there are so many children um, that may or may not be able to return for, you know, a variety of different circumstances. Okay, that's, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you so much thank for you. clarifying that. And thank you for taking the time to make comments, Ms. Janowitz. I appreciate it. And Ms. Broadbent, do we have another caller? Sure. Mr. Silvestro, do we have time for another caller? One, one more. Okay. Uh, Amanda Hughes would like to make a comment. Hello? Yes, go right ahead. Hi, Amanda Hughes, Scotch Plains. Thank you. So a few things. Um, I loved Kristen's suggestion about lunch in the classroom. I thought that was a fantastic idea instead of bringing everybody back into the class, into the uh, lunchroom. That's number one. Number two, high school. We had talked about that last week and Dr. Mast had said that she was going to be going to see the high school classes. I don't have any kids in high school, so this doesn't personally affect me, but I've heard about so many high schoolers not going into class. So I wanted to hear what the findings were um, cause she was going to be going into the class and seeing why so many people had signed up for in person and were not there. Um, supposedly many classes have one or two people and the kids don't want to go. Um, 
Okay. Another thing I loved hearing that my son from my son, that kids want that. Sorry. The teachers are saying that they really want to be teaching them in person. Made me really happy. And I really, I'm very appreciative of the teachers right now. Um, Doug. So before you had mentioned um, when Kristen had said something about uh, last week, the end of the phone call kind of being someone said, two of the board members had said that they felt disrespected. So that's what she was referring to. I know you had thought it was, or had referenced um, not being able to go back and forth, but that's what happened is when she said that they were frustrated. And another board member also said she was frustrated about how these parents were speaking to everyone. So I, I really, really urge everyone not to take any of this personally. It's about our kids. They should be the focus more than anyone else. Not about us, not about you, not about anyone but our kids. And those kinds of comments just make it worse and make more of a divide. So really urge everyone to just think about that. Um, as I'm listening, uh, Brad had made a comment about caring about the safety of teachers. Everybody here, whether you're on the side of virtual or the side of in-person, care about the safety of the students and the teachers. Nobody wants to remove the virtual option. Homeschooling is an option. Weekly testing as the numbers are going to de decrease is not something all parents would agree with. And thank goodness, I just heard the legal ability to mandate that is not there because that's just scary how much can become necessary or, uh, or mandated. Depression's increasing, anxiety is skyrocketing. If you're concerned about kids snacking, you can remain virtual. And as Dr. Mass said, it's all about the time of the mask being off and snacks are quick. There's always an option for people who don't wanna be in person in school, but let those who want to be there, get there. Everyone should have a choice, that's all. Thank you for taking time to make comments again this evening, Ms. Hughes. Douglas, I think that was for me, okay. Thank you. This will close the public comment portion of the meeting. There will be another opportunity later on in the meeting. And this brings us to committee reports. Does anybody have a committee report this evening? No one has, oh, Mr. Murray. I do. I. Um... Realized we didn't uh, do the committee report last week. So um, I have a fa uh, facilities report. So um, we, we spoke of a, a few different items. Uh, the first was um, an update from our district technology manager, Adam Stugach, um, regarding the um, DDoS attack. Um, and he went through the issue that went, went on with um, how it was identified. Um, where the traffic, how the traffic was flooding um, the uh, internet pipes, and then the mitigation steps that were put in place um, with service providers. So that was um, the internet update. And then um, the next um, section, we talked about um, some um, essential uh, purchase, uh, potential purchases that we, we would like to make, or the district would, would, would like to make for, um, for the different schools and um, our grounds and maintenance department, the first being a rooftop unit at Park Middle School for the nurse's office. Um, some additional information is required on that one, so there's no action at this time. Um, two, floor, two floor scrubbers, one for McGinn and one for school one, um, which is, I believe is on the agenda this evening for approval, which we are recommending gets approved. Um, the next was purchasing of uh, vans for some um, equipment that is dated 2006. So this would um, replace some of that outdated equipment. Um, we also talked about um, purchasing steel dump bodies um, that, that would also um, take the place of, of two trucks that are currently 2006, 2007, and the frame is still good. So we'd be replacing what's on them with uh, dump bodies. Um, we're, we're not looking to move forward with either of those. And then the last is a, a backhoe purchase to replace a backhoe that we got from the town, I believe back in 1998. Um, so we are um, requesting approval of that. 
And then um, the last item that was uh, discussed was pricing of a uh, the last school bus in the fleet that is aging out. So uh, school buses have a, a end of life after 15 years. And we've been working over the years to uh, replace them um, in, a, in a staggered schedule. So it wasn't all um, funded at once. So this would be the last one um, in the fleet. So uh, that is currently being priced um, and will need to be purchased uh, at a later time. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Does anybody have any questions? Ms. Mitchell. Thanks, Evan. Um, I just wanna take a quick minute to recognize the IT department who um, their swift manner after the breach um, was so smooth, they took an unfortunate event and rectified it in a professional and timely manner. So just wanted to recognize and thank them for that publicly. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Mitchell. Anyone else? Okay, thanks again, Mr. Murray. Are there any other committee reports that need to be read? Seeing no one that will close that portion of the meeting and move on to letters to the board. There were 11 emails sent to the board and the appropriate administrator responded. And then this brings us to the superintendent's report, Dr. Mast. Thank you, Dr. Kulikowski. I, I am still working on some of my responses. I had um, a family illness this week and it delayed some of my communications, but I have tomorrow slated to, to make, to make the, the outstanding calls. So if you're waiting to hear from me, please, please give me another day. Understandable. Um, so I move that the Board of Education approves the following out of district change in placement for the 2020-2021 school year, case number 10-09. So moved, Winkler. Thank you, Mrs. Winkler. Is there a second? Second, Sariani. Thank you, Ms. Sariani. Is there any question or discussion about this? Seeing no one, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Proceed, Dr. Mass. For 2S, I move that the Board of Education approves the proposed 12 month employee 2021-2022 calendar. Can I have a motion? Second, Winkler. Any question or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Dr. Mast. Move, moving on to, to personnel. Um, I move that the Board of Education approves the superintendent's recommendations for personnel as we discussed in exec. Mrs. Sarajaki, will you please call the roll? I'll, I'll make the first motion. Pardon me. Thank you, Mrs. <laughs> Second, Brody. Thank you, Mrs. Brody. Now, Mrs. Saradaki, will you please call the roll? Um, Mrs. Winkler? Yes. Mrs. Brody? Yes. Mrs. Bauer? Yes. Mrs. Boroff? Yes. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Mrs. Soriani? Yes. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Dr. Kulikowski? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Mrs. Saradaki. Thank you, Dr. Mast. This will bring us to the business functions. So Mrs. Saradaki, whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, the items are that um, I would like the board to consider are the following. Uh, one BUS, the approval of staff training on the report dated February 25th, 2021. Two BUS, three BUS and four BUS were approved on February 18th. 5BUS is the acceptance of the grant award uh, for the high school in the amount of $500. 6BUS is the ExxonMobil Education Alliance grant for Terrell Middle School in the amount of $500. 7BUS is the um, uh, professional uh, 
assistance from Kayati Joshi, Education Resource Group Institute for Teaching Diversity and Social Justice with an approximate cost of $30,000. Eight BUS is a clinical affiliation agreement with Kane University's Graduate Certificate in Nursing. Um, and that's for a time period of February 2nd, 2021 through February 2nd, 2024. Nine BUS are various vendors uh, for the Rep Theater, for the high school drama and for Park Middle School musical production. 10 BUS is educational data services for next year, the 2021-22 school year for a fee of $13,340. Uh, 11 BUS is the Recycling Bid Award. We received two bids for recycling. You can see the price listed on the agenda. Um, we'd like the board to approve Grand Sanitation Services for a three-year price of $26,616. 12 BUS is um, the board acknowledges receipt of the district's fire and security drill reports for the month of January. 13 BUS, the board acknowledging receipt of the board secretary report, treasurer of school fund reports and budget adjustments for the month of January. 14 BUS, uh, the board acknowledges receipt of disbursement listings for the month of January. And 15 BUS, the bill list, for the period February 2nd, 2021, uh, at bill for January 16th through February 22nd, 2021, in the amount of $4,259,196.86. 16 BUS, the Camden County Educational Services Commission. I'm asking the board to approve an additional $10,000 in funding for um, the communication services. 17 BUS, I'm asking the board to approve the two items that um, Mr. Murray reported on. Uh, the first item are two battery floor scrubbers for McGinn and School One at $6,629 each. And that's under the Ed Data bid. And the second item is a new backhoe to replace the backhoe gifted from Scotch Plains Township. Um, the purchase will be made from Hoffman and that's under the Educational Services Commission of New Jersey approved co-op in the amount of $104,254.92. Both of these purchases, the funds will be withdrawn from 2019-20 excess extraordinary aid. 18 BUS, we have a special education settlement where the board will be paying $100,000 per school year uh, for the time period. Oh no, I'm sorry, November 1st through August 31st, 2023. That's through graduation of the student. And those are all of the items. Thank you, Mrs. Saradaki. Is there someone gonna make the motion? So moved, Winkler. Thank you, Mrs. Winkler. Is there a second? Second, Brody. Thank you, Ms. Brody. Is there any question or discussion on the items Mrs. Saradaki proposed? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Thank you, Mrs. Saradaki. Thank you. Uh, this brings us to board policies. Uh, Mrs. Winkler. Yes. So at this time, I'd like to move that the board approve first reading of the following policies. Policy 3159, teaching staff members slash school district reporting responsibilities. And policy 2431.1, athletic activities. Policy 2431.1, uh, for athletic activities, I know um, the current policy has seven years in there as a, like a um, probationary period, and we discussed various uh, lengths of time. We have settled on four years as a probationary period, uh, just as a notice. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Winkler. Is there a second? Second. 
Thank you, Mr. Murray. Any further questions or discussion about these policies? I have a, Mrs. Boroff? I just have a quick question. Um, when we looked at it uh, last week, was it, was, it, was it always, it went from seven years to five, to four, right? Were, was it always four or was I, did I have five in my head for some reason from last week? We, we had initially started with um, the policy was at seven and in our initial discussions in policy, we moved it to three. Um, after some further discussions, we moved it to five and then we settled on four as the compromise. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Boroff and thank you for the explanation, Mrs. Winkler. Any other question or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Very nice, Mrs. Winkler. Thank you. Okay, is there any new board business? Seeing none. Other board business? Any other liaison reports, Mrs. Mitchell? I think this might be other board business, but I wanted to just report. Um, I was at Park Middle School today and I just wanted to commend the bus drivers. The, the windows were open um, every other window. So that's increase, increasing the, the ventilation. So I just wanted to thank the bus drivers for paying attention to that detail. And even as they were sitting with the students waiting, the windows were open for the air to go through. So I just, I thought that was great. I, I only have the example of Park, but I could say with relative certainty, I'm sure everyone is, or hoping everyone is having the same protocol as the bus drivers of Park today. So uh, it was, that was really great to see. Even it was warmer today, but it's still cold. And they were sitting there with no students with the windows open. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you for your comments, Mrs. Mitchell. Any liaison reports? I have a report from the Garden State Coalition of Schools. Thank you, Mrs. Bell, go right ahead. The Garden State uh, Coalition met yesterday. It began uh, with a um, report from the president, uh, David Adderhall from West Windsor Plainsboro. Um, and really the conversation was around the governor's address from the day before and um, uh, his budget announcements. Um, and um, the focus of um, uh, some, especially on um, one-time funding uh, for um, HVAC, PPE, um, sort of environmental uh, related COVID items, mental health and um, what they were calling learning acceleration. Um, and uh, then there was conversation around standardized assessments. Um, the state had applied for a waiver and, uh, but I believe the feds are saying that assessments will have to take place. So there was a conversation around that. Um, the executive director then talked about um, the superintendents um, and the coalition advocating for some kind of guidance for the fall. You've heard um, the comments from um, Dr. Mast and from our attorney. Um, there really is no guidance at this point. We are operating on 30-day emergency extensions from the governor. Um, and um, so a lot of the conversation during her report was around that. Um, and, uh, and then there were some questions um, about whether districts were quarantining after spring break. That became a mini conversation. The guest speaker uh, was Senator Ruiz, uh, who is the Senator for District 29. She is the chair of the Education Committee in the Senate and the Senate President Pro Tem. Um, and uh, she really uh, began just talking about being optimistic again, because of some funding, especially for the three areas I mentioned. That's not ongoing funding, that's um, funding that 
Uh, she said, it's great. We can be creative uh, with those funds. Um, and um, then there were also questions she wanted to have mostly questions rather than her talking. Um, one of the questions I highlighted here was um, related to chapter 44 and the increased costs for districts uh, for healthcare for teachers um, and how that would affect budgets. Um, and then, um, you know, around all the, the kinds of things, will there be a parental choice in the fall? Um, will there be any guidance on, you know, half days, full days, spacing at lunch? Um, um, all of these kinds of issues are really uh, problematic for districts because staffing decisions have to be made by May 15th and there really is no guidance. So, um, you know, part of what the Garden State Coalition is doing is pushing and trying to get answers. So, uh, Dr. Kulikowski and I know Mrs. Williams were there and Dr. Mass, you all may have things that you wanted to add, add or highlight. I, I think that was an excellent summary. Mrs. But it was nice of Senator Ruiz to come and speak with us. And, you know, she is also going through having her younger children at home while she is doing her jobs. So, uh, you know, she gets it. Anybody else have a comment regarding Garden State Coalition? Thank you for your report, Mrs. Bauer. Okay, are there any other uh, liaison reports? Seeing no one, then I will move on to any requests to attend workshops. Um, 3OBB COVID priority resolution was already approved at our last meeting. 4OBB, we have the Youth Art Month for March and we have a resolution. Would somebody like to move the resolution? I'll, I'll move the resolution. Thank you, Mrs. Winkler. Do I have a second? I'll second, Boroff. Mrs. Boroff. Mrs. Winkler, if you'd be do us the honor of reading that. Yep, I move that the Board of Education adopt the following resolution. Whereas art education contributes powerful educational benefits to all elementary, middle, and secondary students, including developing students' creative problem solving and critical thinking abilities, teaching sensibility to beauty, order, and other expressive qualities, giving students a deeper understanding of multicultural values and beliefs, reinforcing and brings to life what students learn in other subjects, and interrelating student learning in art production, art history, art criticism, and aesthetics. Whereas our national leaders have acknowledged the necessity of including arts experiences in all students' education, and whereas March is officially recognized as Youth Art Month, now therefore be it resolved that the Scotch Plains Fanwood Board of Education does hereby endorse March 2021 as Youth Art Month. Thank you. Any question or discussion about that? Didn't think so. All those in favor? Aye. Um, Aye. Motion carries. Everybody raise their hand on the first one. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Winkler. Okay, then that brings us down to our next item, which will be approval of the minutes. And I have a motion to approve the minutes from January 7th, both executive and organizational meeting and the January 21st, the regular and the executive session. Don't move. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Any questions or discussion about the minutes? Seeing no one, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. 
And then that brings us to our next public comment portion of the meeting. So if you want to make a public comment, please go to spfk12.org for the Zoom login information. In accordance with the Scotch Plains Fanwood Public Schools Bylaw 01640165, the meeting will be open for 15 minutes for public comments, maximum of three minutes per speaker, Speakers addressing the superintendent items, business functions, and other board business will be heard first. If time remains, speakers may address other matters. If you would like to make a public comment, please go to spfk12.org for the Zoom login information. When it's your turn, please state your full name and the town in which you reside. Please note board members cannot respond to concerns of individual students or staff members. Such matters should be addressed to the superintendent's office. Ms. Broadbent, do we have a person ready for public comment? Yes, Dr. Kolakowski, Laura Benoit. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Benoit, please unmute yourself. Hi, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone is well and safe. Um, so thank you for your time. I just have a couple of items. I want to state the town in which you reside. Oh, I'm sorry. So my name is Laura Benoit and I reside in Scotch Plains. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I have a couple of items that I'll just run through. First and foremost, I thought that the students did an excellent job on the um, Black History Month presentation. You know, they should be so proud. Their parents should be so proud. And I know we, we parents within the community are, are super proud as well. Um, one question that we had, and obviously we understand you, I can't, you can't answer that here, is if the video, there's an opportunity to share the video with the whole district um, in a sense so that, you know, families can look at it together in their homes. Because I would love to show my elementary student, children, um, the middle school and so forth. So if that's something the district can consider, that would be very helpful. Um, the second thing, just wanting to thank the district um, for the approval of Dr. Josie, and we're just looking forward to seeing the positive outcomes of the inclusion and um, bias training uh, that she's going to instill within, you know, our district. There's great educators already here that are so um, already teaching things, and I think it'll just continue to get better um, as more people understand and learn. Um, other item that I had for, I guess, for you guys to stew on uh, separately is if there's a way to set up some type of resource for parents in need within the school district community. And if there's a way for parents to volunteer to help parents who are looking for resources um, while still respecting people's privacy and so forth. Uh, last or two more points is in terms of, I know in the previous plan in terms of the back to school, uh, I have brought up concerns, and I think some other parents, in terms of the cleaning of high traffic areas. And while we understand it's not necessarily foreseeable to do things every period, if there's an opportunity to get parents to volunteer and look, I'll love to spearhead that if that's an option. I understand right now, parents are not allow allowed within the school building, but maybe there's something that could be set up where parents do an attestation similar to what students have to do every day, um, saying that they've had, you know, haven't been out in different areas, they don't have a fever and so forth, because I'm sure a lot of parents would be more than willing to create a rotation of wiping down high traffic areas within the school to help the resources of the maintenance staff in the school. Um, and then last but not least, as I understand it recently, Milburn implemented a testing service within the community. I understand Mr. Silvestro said that you can't mandate testing, but this is just a resource that they're offering to the teachers and the students um, to make a, a step closer and avide, provide testing. So maybe that's something also our district can look into as well. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you for making comments this evening, Ms. Benoit. Mr. Murray. Dr. Kulikowski, Dr. Mass doesn't mind. I, I just wanted to just kind of add that you know, I know we've been working very closely with the county. I know Dr. Mess mentioned it earlier in the meeting around testing, but I know we've been working very closely with the county as well um, to not only um, understand what, what availability of, of testing there is, but I think also um, understanding the vaccine process and, and, and where, you know, it can help from teachers in our district. So um, I just wanted to just clarify that point. And, and to Ms. Benoit's earlier point around sharing of the video. I think, you know, we all are, are anxious to uh, see the assembly, but I think one of the things that we've been talking about in the student activities and athletics committee as well 
as um, partnering with the communications committee is a way to, you know, engage certain, certain communications with the township as well to blast them out to the community. Um, I think we all saw that was something with tree plenish, which was something that was grassrooted within the school, the high school, and then got communicated out um, through the district, but then also the township was, was also um, engaged in, in putting that out through their communication channel. So I think there are, um, as mentioned earlier, there's some certain, certain hurdles depending on confidentiality and other things that, that we need to get through. Um, but I, I definitely agree. I think, you know, we're, what we're trying to do is ensure that the entire community can have an under, a benefit of what our students are, are doing within the district and how great these things are and, and trying to find the most mediums as possible for them to be communicated out on as long as we're able to without, you know, violating any, any privacy concerns or anything like that. Because like we said tonight, tonight was a fantastic display of, of what our uh, students are able to do. Um, and it's just one of a, a multitude of, of things that we've been seeing. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to make sure I, 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 I kind of talked about that a little bit because we, we are working through it um, because we, we understand it's, it's not getting enough, the, the students aren't getting enough um, positive press from all the good things that they're doing. So how we can get that, you know, more broadly syndicated out into the community is, is something we've been, we've been talking about. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Murray. If I could just add on really quick, um, I would, uh, you know, first of all, thank you for all of that uh, great feedback. And uh, I would just like to reiterate that we are um, get, we are gonna make an elementary school version. And as soon as that's done and we're able to get all the legal proceedings, uh, we're gonna make it available in a link and uh, possibly on the local news. Um, it's just gonna take time as of now. We know we're gonna be able to get it out there. It might just, uh, you know, take us a little time to go through all of that and make sure, you know, nothing's being violated. But as soon as we're able to, uh, we're gonna make sure everybody can see it, uh, everybody who's interested, because we do really wanna get it out there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jaden. Um, Ms. Broadbent, we're ready for our next public comment. Sure, Dr. Kulikowski. Our next caller is Gina Berry. Hi, Ms. Berry, please unmute yourself. Hi, this is Gina Berry Fanwood. Thank you. I just want to kind of piggyback on what Laura just said. She kind of stole everything I wanted to say. Um, I really, really want to commend the, the students, Jaden, Chloe, Gabby, Stella. You guys were absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. You should be very proud of yourself. You did an absolutely amazing job, and I cannot wait to see the video. Hopefully, it'll be up soon. And you can get the clearance so you can do that. Uh, that was that was wonderful. You should be very proud of yourselves. The other thing I wanted to say to the district is thank you so much for bringing on board Dr. Joshi. I'm excited to see what she can do for the district. I know she did some amazing things for other districts. So I look forward for her to work in with, um, with our district as well. And the third thing I wanted to talk about was the desk shield. And I may have missed part of your presentation, Dr. Mass. I know you talked about the desk shield, but was that supposed to be available for all the classroom or just certain classrooms? And how often will they be clean? So those are my comments and questions. Thank you so much, students. You guys were amazing. Yes, they were. Thank you, Ms. Berry. Dr. Kulikowski, Laura Melendez would like to make a comment. Sure, thank you. Hi, um, this is Laura Melendez, Fanwood. Please tell us your town that you reside in. Fanwood. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of comments. First, Again, thank you to, to all the students that um, presented today. The work is amazing. Your initiative and, and taking the leadership position to put this out there, not only for the students to see, but for us here in, in this meeting today is incredible. Um, I am looking forward to seeing this work whenever it's posted. And if it's three months from now, 
that's okay because Black History Month, I think um, Jaden said it best, is it shouldn't be a month. It should be ongoing. Um, so thank you for that. I also want to echo um, Gina's and, and Laura's um, excitement about Dr. Joshi coming on board. Um, I think it's, it's desperately needed and it would be, a, it, it's a great, great initiative for our district um, to make sure that we can recognize biases, um, not only from a racial perspective, but from every perspective. The third thing that I wanted to say um, today is, is to commend you um, for the communications that you have put out there. Um, I am, uh, yes, a little bit anxious when I see the, the cases that are in school, but I am also comforted by that transparency and I hope that it continues. Um, I want to echo um, Mr. Herman's um, re, uh, comments. I also would like to see virtual continuing. Um, I am also uh, very hesitant about unmasking in a classroom. Um, so I just wanted that noted for the record. Um, and lastly, I want to uh, express my complete support for March being uh, Youth Art Month. I think that was incredible and desperately needed as well. So thank you so much. Thank you for taking time to make comment tonight, Ms. Melendez. Dr. Kulikowski, Sharon Filler would like to make a comment. Thank you, Ms. Broidman. Sure. Hi, Dr. Sharon Filler, Scotch Plains. Thank you. So today, um, last week I spoke about some corrections that were being said today. I'd like to speak on behalf of the preteens and the teens that are suffering emotionally. So I wanna give you some insight on a pediatrician's world right now. So as a pediatrician, we used to see ear infections, colds, sore throats. We don't see that anymore. What we're now seeing is a lot of horrible things for kids. So this pandemic is a health crisis, but for our kids, it is a mental health crisis as well. First of all, let me talk about growth charts. You would be shocked to see the growth charts that I see in my office. I am either seeing preteens and teens to have 20 to 30 pound gains in weight, or I'm seeing drastic eating disorders that I'm dealing with. Um, on the, on, uh, to go with that, believe it or not, I'm seeing a huge increase of constipation. And that's because kids are sedentary and they're not eating well and they have increased constipation that we have to now deal with. What's even worse than all of this is the mental illness that I'm seeing. So for instance, Arizona just posted a study showing a 67% increase in teen suicides. Connecticut ER physician just posted that over the weekend, his ER had 33% of suicide teens for a suicide attempts, which is just horrible. Um, I can say for me, I have never seen so much mental illness in my practice that I have seen at all. So what, in fact, I actually just took a course, a REACH course, which is to help teach pediatricians how to treat mental illness uh, to help these kids. Because as you know, psychiatrists and psychologists are very expensive for people. Um, so now I can handle this mental illness a lot better. Um, so I just want to say that what are we, my question is, obviously the best answer is to get our middle school and our high school open full time for our teens, especially those who are suffering. If teens are involved in sports and clubs and band and activities are working, those are the ones that seem to be doing better. The ones who are not involved in those activities are having an issue. Um, obviously this can hit anyone in this time. So it's not just those kids. Anyone can be hit with depression and anxiety right now. Um, you would be very surprised when I'm doing these routines on these kids, their emotional screens are off the charts. 
parents don't know that their kids are suffering. And when I delve further into the history, the schools have no idea that these kids are suffering. So we have a lot of silent sufferers out there. How are we detecting those? Again, obviously if schools are opened full time, we will be able to detect these. If they're not, what are we doing to detect these silent sufferers? Are we doing PHQ-9s? Are we doing Columbia's? Are we doing SCARES? Are we doing ASQs? Which are all um, screening tools that can detect um, kids who are, are, are suffering. So Governor Murphy just passed a $1.2 million, a $1.2 billion federal COVID-19 relief fund for schools with grants for mental health. I think we should jump on that and get those grants and maybe we should be a school starting to screen kids for mental illness. A simple, I can definitely, I am willing to help anyone in the Board of Ed, in the nurses, of Dr. Mass to help get these programs into, and to help teach people how to do these screenings, especially now since I'm certified in this. Um, so PHQ-9 is a simple nine question, quest, nine, quest, nine questions to help determine if someone is suffering. And there is an ASQ-9, which is actually just a simple five point questionnaire to help determine if the person is suicidal. These are crucial, crucial ex things that we need to actually start implementing in our schools, especially with kids absent in the schools. Um, let me just tell you one case. One case was a child I'm, that I'm I heard. sorry, Dr. Phil, I'm sorry to cut you off. I don't, I'll let you finish your comment, but your time has expired about a minute ago. So if you could just finalize your, your okay. last. I'm just very passionate about mental illness and kids right now, because this is what I'm seeing. And I do see a lot of parents crying in my office. I see a lot of kids crying in my office. And this is really an important thing that needs to be discussed. And we need to really try to figure out how we can help silent sufferers who are at risk of suicide. So let, let me just say this. Let me just tell you two more things and then I, you can cut me off. But one, I had one case where the child was having an A plus and dropped to a, a, six, a 68. The, no one found out until the report card came out. This is not our school district, but I'm just saying this could happen anywhere. The parent confronted the school and the school said, oh, we didn't realize the kid was suffering. Turns out the scared, which is an anxiety screening and the Columbia was very significant. This kid was suffering. Dr. Kulikowski, do you mind if I just say, say something um, in response to Dr. Filler? Dr. Filler, thank you for your comment. I, as a, as a clinical social worker, I always appreciate a fellow person concerned about our kids' mental health. And I've posted um, online in some of the town sites as well. And we have another actually social worker on our board um, so I think I, I appreciate your, your, I'm, I'm always the person who is, is talking about our kids' mental health. Um, we actually, I would love to talk to you offline for your practice because I do work for, um, our New Jersey Children's System of Behavioral Health Care, which is actually a national model of care and it's all free services, uh, mental health care coordination for kids. Every single county has an organization that does this. Um, not just during the pandemic, but we've, we've been around for a long time and we provide free mental health care coordination for you know, any kid. And the criteria for involvement is very broad. And we are seeing an uptick in, in kids who are involved with us. There's a mobile response stabilization service, which is a crisis-based service. So there's a lot of help out there for parents. Um, you know, and I, we do get a lot of our referrals from schools. So I know Mrs. Rabimbis, as, as uh, the special services coordinator and I have talked at length about Perform Care and the Children's System of Care Services. And a lot of referrals are made for mental health services um, and all the counselors in the schools, I believe are aware to refer families for that both crisis driven and more long-term ongoing mental health services. So um, it's something that we don't, since we're Medicaid funded, we, we're not um, branding and marketing ourselves all the time around the state, but it does exist. Um, so I would love to talk to you about that. And, um, you know, I, I do know that, that a lot of referrals are made for those services from our district as well. Thank you, Ms. Soriani. I appreciate yeah. your comments. Um, Doug Silvestro, or do we have time for another caller? Yes, we have a, uh, at least time to one more. Okay. Um, Ms. Broadbent, we have another call already? Sure. Uh, Dr. Filler would like to finish your comments. 
Was there anybody else waiting in the line? Because our- No, Dr. Kolakowski. Okay. Hi, Dr. Sharon Filler again. I just wanted to finish my comments. Um, so the, going back to Stephanie Suriani, what my concern is, is that the silent sufferers suffer. So what we have here is a virtual website that was created for people to go to for the virtual mental health. The problem is the silent sufferers are not going to reach out to that. So that's great that you can offer some free services to people. But how are you detecting who those people need services if some kids can't even be detected by their parents, can't even be detected by the schools because they're not in the schools? This is who we need to find is the silent sufferers. So either you need to do some screenings to figure out who is suffering. And I can tell you, I have two kids in high school and they've never been screened or you need to bring them back so that the teachers can see them in person and see that they're not making eye contact. They're not smiling. Um, they're not engaging in the conversations. You know, this is the thing that's an issue. Um, and I do think the big thing is let's try to get that grant from Governor Murphy and let's try to implement these, these screenings tools. My last comment is, um, I just wanna say, there was a quote that I saw that I thought was really re- relevant. And, it, and, and before I say this quote, I wanna say, I am willing to help teach you guys how to do these screenings. And I think these screenings are really helpful to detect the mental illness that is arising because of this pandemic and because kids are isolated and they're alone and they're isolated and they need help. Um, so here is, is the quote. I think it's time to stop seeing our kids as disease vectors. Instead, let's see them as cherished individuals in a society to whom we owe our greatest allegiance and care. There are ways to keep safe to keep safe for adults and children in school. And let's implement those and let's get our kids back to school and let's help them with their mental illness and let's help them with their education. We could still keep teachers safe. We can still keep children safe. And that's it. Thank you. And please, as I said in August, I would love to help you get the kids back into school safely. I would love to help the kids and detect kids who are suffering mental illness. Um, And I I spoke to Dr. Mast about helping to figure out how kids can eat lunch unmasked so that parents don't have to worry about uh, like, like Brad Herman and Melissa, kids can eat and be unmasked for short periods without spreading the illness. Kids, this is what we need to do. And I am willing to help you guys figure this out and, and help move forward. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Dr. Filler. Douglas, does that end our time? Uh, it does, Dr. Kolakowski. Um, if I'm seeing the same list that Robin is, though, I do see that we do have one person with their hand up. We, we've, we've reached the 15 minutes, but uh, it does look like one more person wants to speak. Sure. Uh, Dr. Kolakowski, Brad Herman would like to make a comment. Okay, go right ahead. Hi, Mr. Herman, please unmute yourself. I will help. Anyway, a um, couple of things. Uh, you know, I know Dr. Filler talks about uh, the mental illness issue. What about the anxiety caused by being in front of plexiglass, being masked, worried about kids being able to spread germs to other kids? I mean, I can tell you from experience, my kids are very anxious around any kind of crowded situation at this point. Um, so I think, I think the mental illness is a little more complicated. It's more about transitions. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's a little one-sided as to what the cause here. This is a transition. Everybody is struggling. They see adults struggling around them. So I, I, think, I think it's being uh, oversimplified, the issue. Um, And as far as removing masks to eat, um, epidemiologically speaking, every little mask lapse adds up in an enclosed room. Now the ventilation I know is good. I know you fixed your ventilation systems and I commend you for that. But at the same time, uh, you know, from what 
I know about epidemiology. I actually have a PhD in biomedical science. Um, they teach us epidemiology in big detail. Every little mask lapse adds up indoors. And those tiny little, you know, one kid removing here, one kid removing there, that will add up. And it actually happened at a wedding in Maine, where, which led to seven dead elderly people. So that's all I want to say. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your additional comments, Mr. Herman. I appreciate it. I have one comment. Yes, Dr. Mast. So, so in, in connection to the funding and the, and the granting that's available, I, I just want to um, thank Dr. Filler for, for raising the issue and um, the district is aware and happy that that opportunity exists. We will be pursuing that. Thanks, Dr. Mast. And, and Dr. Kolakowski, uh, one quick point about um, comment from Dr. Filler, if I may. Sure, go right ahead. Um, I, I know Dr. Filler raised the concept of uh, screening uh, by the school district of students for potential uh, mental health concerns. I do want to put out there both for the, the board, the administration, and the public that the board is prohibited by law from um, doing any type of assessment regarding mental health without prior uh, parental consent. Um, and uh, any screening tool that we would use would, uh, as part of the consent process would have to be available for public inspection. So it's not something that we can automatically um, implement district-wide. Uh, it cannot be an, uh, an opt-out kind of situation. Uh, any type of assessment like that would have to be an opt-in uh, prior consent kind of model. Thanks for bringing that up, Mr. Sylvester. appreciate that. Okay, then this will conclude our public comment portion of the meeting for today. And upcoming meetings are on Thursday, March 11th for our open agenda meeting, Thursday, March 25th for the public meeting, Thursday, April 27th for the 22nd for the open agenda meeting and Thursday, April 29th for the regular public meeting. At this time, they're to be determined whether we will be virtual or be in person at that time. Now, if I could have any remarks for the good of the order. Ms. Soriani. I wanna thank the students for staying with us and <laughs> Uh, being present for this whole meeting. I'm, I'm sure that you all have other things to do and other commitments and homework and whatnot. So it was really a pleasure to have you not only present, but just have you with us on the screen. Thank you. Oh, yes, of course. I actually, uh, I love being able to stay here and uh, really listen in and all of this, see what's happening in the district, you know, like behind the scenes. So it was really my pleasure. And I, I, I think I speak for all of us when I say that. Thank you all. Thank you. Ms. Boroff. So I would, I would imagine that you guys, the, the, the students that are on screen right now, were not here for the end of last week's meeting or for last week's meeting, but I, I did, I, I was so excited being on the committee that saw the presentation you guys did last week. I was so excited for the district to see what you were going to be presenting. And um, I feel like I was a little bit spoiled, but I did, it, I, I did say to everyone, I was like, just stay tuned. So I agree with Stephanie, I agree with everyone, just um, thanks for your presence. Thanks for, for, for your collaborations and uh, keep doing what you're doing. I think it's so important. I think peer to peer is, is just, um, I, I loved the same feedback we got tonight. You heard last week from everyone, right? Like, how do we bring this to elementary schools and can we bring this to the middle schools? And um, now you're sort of, sort of starting to see the process of, of the, the board of ed and like the roles that we play in our committees versus our meetings. and and you're bringing that to our kids. So thank you for such a, um, for your presence and being really, really top-notch kids, students. Thank you, Ms. Boroff. Any other comments? Mrs. Bauer. I had really been just gonna echo what um, Mrs. Boroff, what now Mrs. Seriani said, but what Mrs. Boroff put in the chat, which is I think they uh, will be future board members and uh, civic engagement is also one of the things that is important for our students to leave with this sense of being leaders, not just in high school, but for life. So 
maybe being a board member will be on your agenda at some point in the future. Definitely, Mrs. Barrow. This is something good for the resume. Dr. McGarry? Yeah, I would just like to say, um, I've seen the full assembly now twice and it does not disappoint. You will not be disappointed. Um, and I had a chance to walk through the high school today and, and checked in on English classes that were watching it. And um, it, was, it was really great to see our students engaging with other students. Like you said, Mrs. Boroff, peer to peer is, is really powerful. So again, thank you. I, I will follow that up, Dr. McGarry, and just saying that I was a little bit disappointed that my daughter's class doesn't see, see it until tomorrow because I really was so hoping for a reaction today, but I'll, I'll follow up with you with you guys, let, let you know tomorrow. But I was, I was super excited about it. Any other remarks for the good of the order? Yes. I just wanted yeah. to, on behalf of all of us, but especially me, thank you guys for giving us a platform to do this and being able to bring it to you guys and share the presentation with you, although not all of you have seen it yet, but to be able to share what we're going for and what we're doing, it brought the presentation to like a whole other level that we didn't think we were gonna get to. So I just really wanna say thank you for that. You are welcome, Gabby. And I believe the link is in the chat box. If anybody hadn't copied it down yet, it's there. Stella, you'd like to say some words? Yes, I would also like to say thank you so much for this opportunity. This was amazing. But if you guys ever have any other opportunities for us to become more involved, I think I'm speaking for all of us when I say please do not hesitate to contact us. We would be more than happy to be able to participate in anything else or be involved. It would be a pleasure for us. Oh, well, thank you for the offer. We'll keep that in mind. We'd love to see you here again. And anyone else for the good of the order? Okay, seeing none, then can I have a motion for adjournment? So moved, Winkler. Thank you, Mrs. Winkler. Is there a second? Four off, second. Four off, thank you. Uh, any question or discussion about that? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, it's unanimous. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Good night.